Welcome again as we continue this incredible series on looking unto Jesus, 30 amazing descriptions. And boy, it, it's, it, the revelation just keeps getting deeper and deeper. But I, I want us now to go to Revelation chapter 1, and we're going to begin, we're going to read verse 10 and 11, and we're starting into verse 11 today. Verse 10 says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet, saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. And what you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches, which are in Asia, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyteria, Sardis, to Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Now he says four key descriptions here. We've spent a number of weeks dealing with the voice, the sound of a trumpet. What an incredible breakthrough there. But now we're going to dive into these four descriptions, Alpha and Omega and First and Last. Now, they may seem a little redundant, but actually they're very specific and they reveal incredible key truths, probably some of the most important truths. I know I say that a lot, but... These are some of the most important truths and foundational truths in our Christian experience. The one who loves us, and I want you to put this in your spirit, the one who loves us is the Alpha and the Omega. Now, what's very unique about this particular, these particular descriptions, Alpha and Omega, is if you look at all the other descriptions of Jesus, they're very uh, Hebraic. They're very much out of the Hebrew culture and, and out of Hebrew tradition. But these are actually Greek words. They're distinctly heathen. They're distinctly secular. And that must have caught John's attention very specifically. See, this, this, this first letter, the word alpha, the first letter of the uh, Greek alphabet is the word alpha. And it came to me, represent the number one, but actually it specifically speaks to the first or the primary or principle, the most significant. Alpha means the most significant occurrence or the most significant status of a thing. So Jesus' first words that he's actually speaking, he says, I am the alpha. I am the first, I am the primary, I am the most significant occurrence, I am the principal thing. When Jesus declares himself to be the Alpha, he is saying, I'm first, I'm primary, I'm above and I'm highest above everything, whether Jew or Greek. I think that's why he used a Greek term here, because he was saying, listen, I'm not just the highest among the Jews, I am the highest among all, whether Jew or Greek. It is an amazing, that it, it's also amazing when you look at in the book of Revelation, that the Father, now the Father only speaks two times in the book of Revelation, and both times that the Father speaks in the book of Revelation, He also calls Himself the Alpha and the Omega. So there is, once again, we see this unity of the Godhead. We see this unity of descriptions where God the Father, and we're going to come into a breakthrough on why that's so significant probably in the next session, but I want you to put that deep inside of your spirit that both Jesus and the Father call themselves the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. The word Omega is the, the letter Omega is the final letter in the Greek alphabet. And it also speaks of the uttermost end or the extreme end, the final thing, final one or final thing of everything. It literally means the final part. So Jesus is saying, I am the first, I'm the primary, I'm the highest above everything, and I also am the final part. I am the capstone of all of eternity. God is saying, I am first, put this in your spirit, I am first and foremost above everyone and everything. I am also the extreme end of all things. And I consist of everything in between. I am the first and foremost. I am the extreme end. And I fill everything that is in between. All of it is filled with me. All of space, 
all of time, all of matter, all of that which is seen and unseen. I fill it completely with myself. Let that meditate in your spirit for a bit. The fact that the God who loves us is literally surrounds everything and fills everything with himself. Jesus also declares this same time, same title at the beginning and at the end of the book of Revelation. So here in chapter 1, he describes it. But also look at Revelation chapter 22. It's kind of interesting. At the beginning, Alpha. At the end, Omega. And he uses the same description two times. Revelation 22, verse 12 and 13. And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to to his work, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. So Jesus is before all and after all. He was before the beginning and he will be there after the end. He is the capstone. I'm going to say it again. Jesus is the capstone of all time, space, and dimensions. He is before everything and he is after everything. Let's go to John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word, which speaks of Jesus, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He, Jesus, was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. Jesus was in the beginning... And everything that was made was created by him and through him. He, he, is, he is telling us, I want you to focus on this. Guys, this begins to change everything, the focus of everything. When you look at Jesus, everything that you see, everything in the created realm, it was created by Jesus, through Jesus, and put this in your spirit for Jesus. I'm going to say that again. Everything that was created was created by Jesus, was created through Jesus, and was created for Jesus. He is, the abs he is absolutely in total and complete control. He is before the beginning and he is after the end. Let's go to Psalm 33. I like, I like this psalm. Psalm 33, beginning with verse 6 through 11. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. Now remember what we just read in John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the word. So it's not just speaking about the word spoken, but Jesus is the word of God. That Greek word in John 1.1 1, 1 is the Greek word logos, which literally means speaks of, of the essence of the word. It's, it's the personification of the word of God, which is Jesus. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. And all the host of them, by the breath of his mouth, he gathers the waters of the sea together as a heap. He lays up the deep in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. So Jesus is letting us know that no matter how much it seems like evil is winning, he has everything under total control. He formed everything. He controls everything. Look what he says in verse 10. Look at this. The Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He makes the plans of the peoples of no Effect. Now, guys, this is so vitally important. I believe it's one of the reasons that why this description of Jesus as the Alpha and Omega is so vitally important for the days we're heading in. Because it is going to increasingly look like wickedness is winning. We see what's happening around the world. We see the political turmoil. We see the corporations working together with the globalists and this demonic agenda to remove every belief in God, every trust in God, and to replace God in society. We see the assault coming, even here in America. 
They're coming after people that stand up for pro-life. They're coming after them with, with uh, the, the Department of Justice and with uh, all kinds of, uh, of lawsuits and all kinds of things going after Christians. And it's only going to increase. In a number of nations around the world right now, it is illegal to actually preach certain parts of the Bible. They've made certain parts of the Bible talking about the sin of homosexuality, talking about the uh, other sins, that it is illegal. You can't speak against transgenderism. You can't speak against other things because it's considered hate speech. They've made the word of God as, as, as an illegal by calling it hate speech. In fact, I even seen recently they're now in certain places declaring that if you tell people they're going to hell, that is hate speech and threats of violence. Well, uh, I don't know what to do with that because that's God saying it. But they want to say, no, shut up about it. Don't talk about it. Don't speak about those things. And Jesus is wanting us to know that the Lord himself, the one who's the Alpha and the Omega, brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He makes the plans of the peoples of no effect. It doesn't matter how masterful they lay out this plan and this trap. God's plan is going to be fulfilled. God's eternal plan. The counsel of the Lord, verse 11, the counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart to all generations. So I wrote this down. I want you to put this in your spirit. No matter what power of wickedness seems to stand up against God and his holy servants, God's word, God's plan, God's purposes will be completed. This love story will have the happiest of endings. <laughs> and that's what we were part of, the most amazing love story. And the one who loves us says, I, I am the primary first and foremost. I am the alpha and I am the Omega. I am the beginning and I am the uttermost end and I fill everything in between. In the days we're entering, it's going to seem, listen to me, it's going to seem more and more like evil is winning. We talked about the LGBTQ and when I keep adding things to it, uh, agenda and the globalist agenda and the climate crisis agenda, supposedly agenda and the pandemics and all, every force to try to undermine and take control, take away the freedom of people. And ultimately, you have to view everything through this. This is a battle between the devil and God. And it's between those that hate God and those that serve and love God. And all of the things that are happening in the world are, are wrapped up in that eternal battle that's taking place. And Jesus is letting us know, you be at total peace. You keep your mind stayed on me. You be at perfect rest in your spirit, no matter what goes on, because I am in absolute control. Let's go, go back to Psalm 33. Let's look at verse 13 through 16. The Lord looks from heaven. He sees all the sons of man. From the place of his dwelling, he looks on all the inhabitants of the earth. He fashions their hearts individually. He considers all all their works. No king is saved by the multitude of an army, and a mighty man is not delivered by his strength. Behold, the eye, oh, this verse 18 and 19. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope in his mercy to deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in famine. There is, God is saying, it doesn't matter how strong they are, it doesn't matter how powerful. Nobody's saved by their army. Nobody's saved by their military might. Nobody's saved by their own strength. It is the Lord and the Lord alone who is our deliverer and God and God alone who will work out his plans and his purposes. There is great inward power and strength that fills us as we focus on Jesus as the Alpha and Omega. He and he alone. And I want you to put this word very deep in your spirit. He and he alone is preeminent above and over all things. That word preeminent, he is supreme above everything. Let's go to Colossians chapter 1, verse 15 through 18. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. 
For by him all things were created that were in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or power, principalities or powers. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. He is the head of the body. Now, let's pull out for a second. Look at verse 18. There are four distinctive things we're going to draw our attention to that he's saying about Jesus in verse 18. Let's go back to it. Verse 18, Colossians 1, 18. He is the head, there's the first one, of the body, the church, who is the beginning, number two, the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, number three, that in all things he may have the preeminence. So Jesus is the head, he's the beginning, the firstborn, so that in all things, all things, he may have preeminence. And again, I want you to put that word preeminence very deep in your spirit. Because we're going to dive into something here in a moment to understand that God's plan, God's purpose in sending Jesus here, was that Jesus might be preeminent over all things. Let's look at this closely. First, he is the head. Jesus is exalted as the head. It's a, a Greek word, kephali. He's the head of the church, which means he is the ultimate authority over the church. It is his will and his word that governs and energizes the life of his church. I'm going to say that again. It is his will and his word that governs the life. That's why all these different churches, they keep following and say, well, we need to be sensitive to the culture and aware of cultural changes. No, you don't. In fact, quite the opposite. You need to stay consistent with the word of God. What does he say about himself? I am the same yesterday, today, and forever. The preeminence and the predominant purpose of the church is the glorification and exaltation of Jesus. He is the head, not society, not cultural whims or changes or shifts or beliefs. Jesus and his word, all things were created by him and through him, by his word and the word is, the Word, the living Word, the Word, the written Word, the Word is the head of the church. I want you to understand, the Word is the head of the church. So we've got a lot of people out there, they're throwing out whole sections of the Word, whether they're compromising in a more liberalism form of quote-unquote Christianity, or whether they're compromising through a hyper-grace message, they are discarding whole sections of the Word. Some say, well, the Old Testament doesn't apply. They're discarding whole sections of the Word. Others say, well, we can't properly, you know, we need to bend to culture and be more sensitive, and we'll, we'll emphasize on the love of God, but not on the judgment of God or other aspects of God. They are, they are removing parts of the Word. Jesus says, I'm the beginning, I'm the end, I founded everything, I'm finishing everything, and I fill everything in between. And I, Jesus, am the head of the church. I am the absolute final authority over everything that is done and everything that is said and everything that's supposed to operate within and function within the church. Second, Jesus says, he is the beginning. It's a Greek word, uh, uh, arche. He is the start of everything or its point of origin. I saw an interesting uh, sermon just the other day and I was watching it. It was really a fascinating sermon by uh, Frank Peretti. He wrote the uh, some famous books back in the 1980s on spiritual warfare, This Present Darkness and others. And he had this example that human beings need to have a point of reference, an absolute point of reference. And he kind of put a chair in there. And he said, if you were standing in a completely dark room, and it was a round room, so you, you, know, you didn't know, but you, could, you were feeling around, you couldn't find, and he found a chair, and the chair's in the middle. And that chair's in a fixed place. 
then you, from that fixed place, you can begin to venture out, go out three steps, come back three steps, go out this way, and you can begin to explore the world around you. But if you just pick that chair up and carry it with you, you no longer have any fixed point of reference. You have no idea where you are. The Word of God, Christ, is the fixed point of everything. He is the origin and He is the ending of all things. He and He alone is our fixed reference point. Everything that we are to view through life through, our, what we call our worldview, every thought, every, every philosophy, everything that goes on, we must through filter through the fixed point of the absoluteness of God and that God created all things. In fact, that's exactly what Paul said when he was addressing the leaders there in, 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 in the Greek empire. And he, he went in and they didn't have any reference. They weren't Jews. They didn't have any reference to the Jewish terminology. And he said, I've, I've been going around. And he said, I, I found a God that you, have, that you worship. You have a temple to him, to the unknown God. Well, let me tell you who the unknown God is. I'm going to paraphrase. But he said, he's the one who created everything. He's the one. He's the fixed point. He is the beginning. He is the origin of all things. So Jesus is the head of the church, the absolute authority. He is the origin of all things. And this is true, uh, as, as the full hymn tells us, and I'm, I'm, I'm quoting from this scholar, not only in the creation, but also in the redemption or the new creation. He co who commanded, let, be, uh, let light be, and light was, is the same who is shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God is revealed in the face of Jesus. I know you know that verse so well. 2 Corinthians 4, 6. The third thing, and we've already talked about this quite a bit, is he's the firstborn from the dead. The word can certainly mean first in order of birth, but it also can mean first in order of importance. Jesus was the firstborn among this new creation, but he's also first in order of importance. And all three of these, the head, the beginning, and the first or uh, for, firstborn, points us to the ultimate preeminence of Jesus. Finally, Jesus is preeminent. That means he is first in everything, first in importance, first in honor, first in exaltation. And the, it's interesting, the grammar of this verse indicates that Jesus is the head and the beginning and the firstborn in order that he, or for the purpose that Jesus might be the preeminent one. Now, put this in your spirit. Embedded in each of those glorious references to the person of Christ, the head, beginning, firstborn, and preeminent is the idea that Jesus is absolutely first in every sphere of life. In fact, the fact that Jesus is the preeminent one must have real-world application to the life of the believer. Jesus must be preeminent in our lives. He must be first, not just on Sunday morning or when you show to church or first just when, you know, in, in certain areas. He must preeminent, be preeminent in every aspect of our lives. Colossians 1.19 says this, For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. In other words, it was the Father's good pleasure that Jesus should be the supreme agent of creation and redem redemption. This means, now this is, this is the Grand Slam home run right here. I want you to get this. this is, we're going to end with this. This is going to shake you. This means that the ultimate goal of salvation was not in bringing human beings to salvation, but the ultimate goal of salvation is the exaltation of the Son of God to the status of supremacy. I'm going to say that again. The ultimate goal, and I'm going to show you in scriptures here, but the ultimate goal of even God sending his son Jesus here was not just that we could be rescued from hell and go to heaven, although we are the glorious recipients of this incredible plan, but it was that Jesus might be preeminent and supreme in all things. Let me read you one last scripture. Colossians 1, 19 and 20. For it pleased the Father, I just read this, but put it again. For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell, and by him to reconcile all things to himself, 
by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of the cross. It was God's will and God's plan that all the fullness, that everything would consist within Jesus, that Jesus would become supreme and be supreme over all things, whether created, all created things, whether in the natural realm or the, or the spiritual realm, and that all things would be consummated in him. All things would be in him and he would be supreme over everything. Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega. We're going to pick this up and go much deeper in the spirit in the next lesson. I'll see you then. Bye-bye.